Leroy Rosinia, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I was speaking to John Barnes last week about the improvements that we've seen in tackling racist abuse directed at players. Um, what do you think were the key steps in reaching a point where we are now compared to back in the day when you guys were playing? Well, the, the, the fans um, weren't happy with it. Um, you know, uh, they were going into an environment where they'd sat next to people who were abusing players. And players um, have stood up as well about it, which means that clubs have had to do something about it. And what has happened is, I think there's been a, uh, you know, where, where I used to play, the peer pressure was that, that if someone was racially abusing you, everybody would join in. Now it is something which is frowned upon. Um, you know, that people look at it, they see it happening. And it's something that they, they don't want to happen. So and there's a lot more people who want to stand up and do something about it, want to make it a better environment to take their kids. And, you know, along, along the way, in their own, I say, small ways, the players have become more aware that they can have an influence on stopping it. And clubs have become more aware that they can have an influence on it. You know, there's you know, massive chants and songs that, that, fact, that clubs, you know, put out calls to their fans and say, this is unacceptable. I do wish that sometimes they were stronger in their approach, but at least they're recognising that it happens in the first place and addressing it. And in doing that, they've made people aware who do go to grounds that it is unacceptable. They, they, they've always had a, a feeling in the back of their mind that it just doesn't feel right and they're prepared to do something about it. So that's why. And it's also a criminal offence now. You know, the police have stepped in and said, look, it's a criminal offence for you to behave like that within the ground. Everybody knows that now and they're aware of that. And, um, and so that's why it's made it a better environment, I think, uh, in football stadiums. Still not perfect, far from it but a better environment in terms of the way that the fans address the players. In society over the past couple of years, we've seen a very divided nation. Um, we've seen hate crimes spike by quite a lot. So what do you think has changed in the mindset of the UK to reach a position where we are now? Uh, because the message coming from people like government is that it's okay to hate. Um, in the language that's been used uh, by some, lots of people in authority, unchecked, unchallenged, and so people think, well, it's all right to, to think that way. And then, you know, obviously the, 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 the less intelligent go out and re reenact it in real life on, on people. Um, but it comes from the top. It comes from leadership. And when you have people, you know, uh, uh, addressing things like the burqa as letterbox, uh, letterboxes and, uh, and, and then arguing that it's all right to use that sort of language there's loads of examples that, that i can use there are people who will take them and think yeah it's, it's all right to have those views and to then go and uh, uh, and reenact them they don't intellectualize it like you know people in government do say look I'm, I'm, i was using it in a different context they just take that word take that and paraphrase it and go and use it and say to justify their hate towards uh, another person or, or religion or, or or someone else so that's why uh, Brexit certainly hasn't helped. It, it, was, it was something that justified that, you know, it was immigrants that were causing all the problems and migrants that, you know, coming over there in their millions and thousands and taking our jobs. It just kind of um, gave, gave those people a foundation to go and really um, hate um, in, their, in, their, in their personal lives. And uh, it was not challenged at the highest level. And that language and that, that attitude towards other people was actually condoned uh, at some times. And that's why we've had a rise in hate crime. And, uh, and that's why we're having to try and draw back from this, that period of Brexit where hate was all right. Hate was okay, it was their fault. It was their fault that you know, they've come over here and made our society like it is. They've been the cause of all our problems. And we've had to try and draw back from that. But that's the reason I think that hate has been on the rise. In your many years now of campaigning against racism, um, what have you found to be the most successful methods of doing that? What do you feel that people respond to the greatest? Well, it's, it's a simple answer. Education, education, education. And it starts not just for young kids, but for everybody. You know, obviously I've been into to schools and to, you know, from primary schools, secondary schools, but also done teacher training. But what, what I found is when you've gone back and to, to those schools and kids have gone and shared it with their parents, they've kind of been the ones who've educated their parents. And, you know, and, and lots of parents didn't know that certain things meant certain things and the connotations of certain things and words and the power of words. And so it is education, education at all levels. And I think it's from bottom up and from the top down as well. You know, because I was talking about 
you know, the, the influence on hate crimes from people in positions of power, they need educating as well because their words are important. You know, they, they do recognise that words are important when, when they, they, they're talking about get Brexit done and the effect that that has on, on people, the slogans like that. Well, words, racist words and words that divide are also just as important and that they need to realise that as well. So it's not just the bottom up, it's from the top down. And hopefully when you meet someone in the middle, you'll find that everybody's educated. It's been a couple of weeks now since Show Racism the Red Card launched our new film Challenging Racism Towards Our NHS Workers, which really explored the racist abuse suffered by clinicians in the NHS. Um, to any NHS staff that are on the receiving end of racist abuse, um, what would you say to them? Well, they report it. They report it straight away. They take themselves away from that situation and report it to uh, you know, a, a person in a position of authority. And it needs to be dealt with. And you know, you can't take into consideration whether someone is ill or not. It's a crime to racially abuse someone, especially in that environment, when someone is trying to help you. And you know what, there has to be a zero tolerance. You know, if someone's being abused, I know these people are magnificent, they do their jobs under unbelievable circumstances. But if you're being racially abused, you're trying to help someone, try and make someone better. You have to take yourself out of that environment and deal with that situation because you're not able, able to do your job. And that person needs to, it needs to be made clear to that person that that is unacceptable. And, and if they want to continue to get, um, air those views, then they won't get the, they won't get the uh, um, I suppose, the, the, what's required, the treatment that's required. And I know it sounds harsh, but I think that's, that's got to be the right way. You know, someone's being racially abusive towards someone who's trying to help them. I think that's even worse. And so my advice to them would be take yourselves out of that situation, report it and uh, to, to the, 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 your, your um, uh, person in authority and they should deal with it in an appropriate way to make sure that person stops doing it or they don't get the treatment that they require. The film also explores the institutional racism within the NHS and the heightened barriers that BME people have to face when it comes to career progression. Um, so what do you think can be said for that? Well, look, it's, it is institutionalised racism. When I think I watched the film, and I think there's about eight, 16 years ago, there were 12 people who were senior, senior nurses, and now it's 10. And uh, that suggests that the people who are interviewing do not see people who of colour in positions of authority. They just don't see it. And it's something that happened in football for many, many years. You know, there's lots of people who, who saw black players as not people who could lead. You never saw black players being made captains. You never saw, uh, when I was managing, when I came out of football, there was only two or three black managers in the positions of, of authority. Because one of the people doing the interviewing are people who usually want to see people in their own light, and there's not usually anybody from a BAME background interviewing. So they see people as um, you know, people of colour as subordinates and people who are underneath them and should never have a position of authority. And that is why. You know, we talk about institutionalised racism and it's got to change. And the, to change that, you have to have positive discrimination. You really do. You need to say, look, this job is that, yeah, if you have uh, people who are uh, from a certain background, they need to have an opportunity, more of an opportunity to get that job because the knock on effects will be really, really positive. And you only put in positive discrimination in for a certain amount of time until the numbers start to balance up because you'll find that your organisation works so much better because you get a real balance of people in a different, a few, a different views coming from different angles and you get most things right. So this is a positive thing to have positive discrimination. So yeah, there is institutionalised racism. It's just the way things have been for a very, very long time. Certain people who look a certain way get jobs of, uh, uh, of power. Um, but I put it this way, you know, 10 years ago when... Uh, if someone had a tattoo, you, you, no one would ever think of giving them a job because they had a tattoo. They judged them by because they had something uh, uh, on, on their skin. Well, what I happen to have is something on my skin, which is a colour brown. And that's exactly the same way people are viewed. But in those 10 years, people now have tattoos and they're in positions of authority because the attitude towards tattoos is that hey, it's a good thing. It's a cool thing. That certainly hasn't been the case with people of colour and positions of authority and people have got to change that they, they, they can check they can change it but again it comes back to education and positive discrimination when you're interviewing for certain jobs so we can get the numbers balanced in terms of in, in relation to society 
and you'll find that your organisation is much better balanced and works uh, much better as well. Do you think that enough progress has been made at the minute when it comes to tackling racism? Not enough. And that's what frustrates me. It really does frustrate me because, and the reason why I say not enough, because I, I, I seem to be having the same arguments year after year after year. And when, and there needs to be um, something, I, I, I would describe as a thread running through the country uh, where no matter what happens, and we're going to obviously through COVID-19 and coronavirus at the moment, last year it was Brexit, you know, what, no matter what, what happens, a change of government, there's a common thread of anti-racism going through everything that we do. And it doesn't matter if it's Labour or Conservative or Liberals or we've Brexit or we've got coronavirus. It, 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 it's the foundation around everything that we do and it is natural. And so that's where we need to get to. Instead of trying to raise funds to do certain projects, to, to deal with a, a, a problem over there and a problem over there, it has to be a part of the norm, in fact, in everything that we do, that we don't think twice about, about, about it, but we do. And we have to fight for everything that we do. And when, and when, we, stop, when we can stop fighting to get anti-racism into everything we do, that'll be the time when you will say, yeah, we, we are making real progress. And some, because at the moment it seems like it's two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back because people don't have it as a priority. They have that, don't have it at the top of their agenda. It's one of the first things that go, charities and, and funding organisations like Show Race and the Race, uh, Show Race and the Red Card. When there's a, a lack of funds, it's the first thing to go. It shouldn't be, it should be the last. Because the most, most important thing that underpins everything that we really cherish in our society. Leroy, thank you so much for your time. Take care. No problem, pal.